Episode 99 taking place from an office from our distributor here in Toronto, Canada. Shout out, Canada. I got a good one for you today. Greg Struck from Noops, and I've got Christine Barrington from Sundance. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's thank my you. pleasure. It's my pleasure. We learned something new, Greg. If nobody knew this, Noops is spelled spoon backwards. I like it. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the, the company. When did it start? What's it all about? Sure, absolutely. Noops is disrupting an iconic uh, comfort food and pudding. It's multi-billion dollar category, been around for over 100 years. Uh, no, nothing has changed since Jell-O was patented in 1897 and yet 150 million Americans ate pudding last year. So the writing on the wall is there for us to come in and disrupt a great iconic American comfort food in pudding. And uh, that's what we're going to do. What were you doing before this? I've been a food and beverage entrepreneur for the last 17 years or so. Prior to this, I was a COO and founder of a company called HungryRoot.com, which is a direct to consumer aggregator of better for you groceries. And prior to that, I found and sold a ready to drink iced tea company. Thematically, I've always stayed with taking everyday products and making them better for you. And I, that probably came to be because I wanted to be a restaurateur. I wanted to change the way people in this country were eating. But when I realized the cost of real estate in New York City, it threw me uh, to a quick pivot into uh, CPG. And that's where I've hung my hat for the last uh, almost two decades now. Got it. And we're not talking about the real estate where you're buying a, uh, a 700 foot uh, studio apartment for a million and a half bucks, folks. But anyway, that's for another episode uh, <laughs> on... Uh, anyway. uh, let's go for the, the exact timing of the startup. Uh, what did you do first? What were the first sort of steps as far as getting this off the ground? Yeah, you know, firstly, uh, going back to my French Culinary Institute roots, I wanted to take product off the shelves and really start to iterate in my, in my home kitchen. I turned it into a, a miniature commercial kitchen and really started to uh, test products on my three little guinea pigs at home. I've got three kids at the time. They were ages two. Uh, three and five, and they were the perfect people to jump in and start testing pudding. And that started in 2019, really got serious about the idea of disrupting pudding uh, 1.0 with pudding 2.0, looking at uh, why all the nutritional glory has gone to pudding's cousin, yogurt over all these years. And uh, from there, uh, spent the back half of 19 innovating and uh, was ready to uh, take the product to a commercial scale run into 2020 and into a test launch in the uh, in the middle of COVID. We, uh, we've not heard of uh, that, that thing that you just described. Um, we will not talk about that uh, through this uh, episode. Uh, but yes, in March 2020, uh, something, which we will again not name, uh, occurred. And walk us through where you were at at that time when you did say you launched it. Give us sort of a little play-by-play -play there. Yeah, it was actually a very interesting time. If you would have told me when this company uh, at the beginning of this company, if I would launch a product or test a product in, in, in that thing we won't mention, I would have told you you're nuts. But I've always led with, we as entrepreneurs have a ton of resiliency. We get knocked down, we jump right back up. And this was no exception. So for, for my team and I, we used it as an opportunity to do a small market test in Q3 of, 20, of 2020, just to really see how D2C would fare for us how retail would fare for us and take that knowledge after three months, wrap it into further R&D in Q4 of 2020 for uh, a Q121 launch. And, and, and we did it. We used the time wisely. We went and reformulated. We had an initial product line of six SKUs. We cut them down to four SKUs after getting good uh, consumer and retailer buyer feedback. And I think ultimately we were smart about not rushing into um, a, a, into a place head first in a period of great uncertainty, we kind of paused and said, wait a second, what can we do right now? We know our sales pipeline is obliterated. How can we use the next six months in the smartest way possible to ensure that when this baby is birthed and does come to market, we can go out really strong? So I'm really proud of the way we handled it. It, it was a good, good lesson. Talk to us about branding. I think you have a unique uh, a brand approach, uh, the look and the feel. I remember when this had launched, uh, I knew you had um, experience in space. 
Uh, walk us through this, you know, sort of what you were thinking with that, you know, look, feel, design, uh, and, and why you went that route. Sure. I mean, we wanted to take a, a, a product category and completely turn it upside down or backwards on its head. And, and we would take traditional product that had been sold in these really sad uh, plastic, you know, uh, containers. And we said, can we be the new entrant? Can we come with bold, beautiful, color blocked packaging, stuff that's unique, that really stands out on shelf? Can we also utilize it to attract an, a, a consumer's attention in the very short period we have being a retail first or omni-channel channel brand? And the idea there was we're going to target the female head of household, 25 to 75, who generally makes purchase decisions for the family. And there was a really systematic approach to doing that. We didn't want to go out to kids early on, even though this product is top nine allergen free and perfect for, for children. Children are notoriously picky little critters. So we wanted to start with that kind of reinvigoration, reimagining how the product could be in, in this category that's been tired and has been around for over a hundred years. And that was kind of the idea behind it. Let's be bright, let's be bold, let's stand out and shelf. Kids are picky, folks. Uh, Amen. There is your takeaway uh, from this episode. Uh, yes. Um, you know, but start them early. I, I'm just going to do one little caveat. Start them early. Let them understand fats, proteins, carbohydrates. People know me. I'm a balanced nutrition, 100%. It is what it is. Deal with it. Um, let's go into later in 20. So we get an idea what the business looked like. Let's talk. Yeah, you know what? Let's jump in 21. Q1 21. What does the business look like? Where are the distribution points? And how is your direct to consumer look too? Absolutely. So just to touch on the D2C aspect first, we did a D2C test in Q3 of 2020. We realized very quickly being a perishable pudding brand, it's highly unprofitable for us to try and sell 12 and 24 packs of pudding and pay for all the ancillary costs, uh, thermal liners, overnight shipping, gel packs. We did find out though that obviously um, it's very incredibly important to be omni-channel. So we thought about how can we crack the code to being an omni-channel brand, even though we're proudly retail first. And the idea there was to use our existing retail distribution network to take advantage of best in class cold chain um, companies, regionally fresh direct, nationally hungry root and perfect foods, et cetera, all these wonderful platforms we've launched on and will be launching on and ultimately use that, their platforms to offer the consumer a better shop, shopping experience, purchase noops as part of your weekly shop by one, two, three SKUs at a time. We're not roping you into 12 or 24 pack purchases at a cost price point that's much lower than what you would have paid if you were owning company owned D2C. In time, when we do make an ambient pack, we'll absolutely um, reconsider the DDC proposition in terms of being company owned. But right now we have, we, we recognize that in a post COVID world, shoppers have generally moved offline away from the retail segment. And uh, for us, we wanna take advantage of that and ensure that we have a good base and we are able to be omni-channel. It's vitally important, even though we are proudly retail and my thesis is counterintuitive, I believe that retail is our biggest moat, D2C is not. Um, what I'll say is, yeah, so it was a really good, good idea. We launched Q1 of 21. Knock on wood, so far we have uh, not had any retailer say no. And I take very, a lot of pride in, in that data. We are in about 300 uh, best in class indies, high value indies in the Northeast and the North Atlantic region right now. And we're slowly moving across the country. We've got global launches planned in Sprouts and Wegmans for the back half of this year, as well as um, onboarded in terms of distribution with uh, KEHI, with UNFI across the country, as well as regional DSD uh, in the New York metro market, which is our backyard, and, and really gearing up for, for a really, really big year ahead. So, so far, blessed to be here, blessed on the market timing of this proposition, thankful to all the buyers for believing in us, and, and we're off to a really, really strong start. There's a, a piece to take away about direct to consumer. It, it's not for all businesses. Um, there are there are I think a hundred reasons. Um, there are multiple as far as packing, as far as shipping, as far as what's involved there. That's one. Two is as he just sort of said, as far as all you know, as far as the hurdles. There there's many that fall into the uh, into the digital aspect, into the advertising, into the spend, into the costs associated versus what you're able to get as far as the cart. You know, how much is that customer willing to put in the cart? Does it offset? It, it's, 
it, there's no one way to do this. Uh, there is no doubt that an omni-channel, which people love the buzzwords, buzz, 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 they like to use it. The reality is if you can diversify, that's the word, your business, as far as how you're selling, that's wonderful. It's amazing. Um, but please look at your business, look at the financial metrics within each of the categories and decide, is this something that's working for us? Uh, or is this something that we want to continue to invest in? But definitely, definitely make it make it, you know, sort of a, a real hard, hard stance as far as when you do have those final figures and decision making, you know, so that could go on forever. Um, let's close this thing out as far as noops, which is spelled spoon backwards. I have to say it again. Anybody miss that? Okay. What is the, the year going to close out at? Where do you guys want to see yourself, let's say, at the end of the year? But more importantly, where do you see yourself in 12 months from now? So summer 22. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're going to see a growth story of 2,400 points of distribution inside of year one. You're going to see that four and a half X to over 10,000 points of distribution in year 22 when we, when we start to release club drug and mass as well as conventional banners. And uh, really ambient packaging as well. We have a ton of amazing innovation in the pipeline. We're just getting started. For us, Chobani is a really strong comp. We view Nukes as really a newcomer brand to disrupt the multi-billion dollar legacy incumbents that have been around forever. Here's a quick stat for you. $350 billion last year, the top 25 food and beverage companies did in the U.S., 50 billion of that was attributable to legacy food brands. So we believe there's a great place for Nukes to play in there. We're getting started with an iconic American comfort food and pudding, and we're really, really excited to uh, to see where we're going to go. Very cool. Greg, great to have you on here. Christine. Thank you so much. We're throwing it over to you. We're going to be talking about Sundance. Give it to us. What's the story? Um, so first, I want to say thank you so much for sharing your time and your network with us. Uh, it's so kind of you. Um, so D Sundance specializes in all sorts of types of printing and packaging. Um, we're proud to be Florida's first green offset printer. Uh, we, we have some pretty important certifications like SGP and FSC that are both in the sustainable packaging realm. Um, I personally specialize in helping startups with new flexible packaging and, and pouches and ball stock, but we also do labels, folding cartons, POP displays, brochures. Um, we've got a 45,000 square, square foot facility. So we have a lot of in-house capabilities to, to help everybody with all their printed needs. Nice and concise. I like that. I love it. those elevator pitches that are just oh, on target. It all in. <laughs> good, good stuff, Christine. Greg, I put your info there. I don't know where this is going to land. Christine, info there. Have a successful rest of the week. My man, you too. And great, good, good trip in Canada. Enjoy it, man. Take it easy. I, I appreciate that. Thank Absolutely. you guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much.